A warm welcome to Diplomatic Channel. I'm Amarachi Ubani. This week, President Bola Tinubu receives the president of Guinea-Bissau here on a special assignment. First, the EU presents its final report on the 2023 elections. Where does it put Nigeria? Later, we'll discuss the latest happenings in the Russia-Ukraine war with political analyst Professor Femi Otubanjo. Stay with us as we begin with other discussions in diplomatic circles. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky has been having high-profile meetings since the attempted Wagner mutiny nearly two weeks ago. On Saturday, he met with the Spanish Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez in what his office says is his first act to demonstrate the EU's undivided support to Ukraine in all fields, military, humanitarian and economic. Spain is taking over the European Union's six-month rotating presidency, and Ukraine hopes Sanchez will help her gain influence in Latin America, where several countries have opposed Kiev's efforts to retake the territory occupied by Russia. President Zelensky also played host to former U.S. Vice President Mike Spence, who is running for the Republican nomination in the 2024 presidential election. Mr. Pence vowed to keep providing Ukraine with the support it needs for the duration of the conflict. He also visited three cities and villages near the Ukrainian capital, including Bucha, Arpin and Moschun, to see the destruction from Russian shelling since the invasion in As February I learned, last President year. Zelensky and his the third China-Africa Economic and Trade Expo in central China's Human Province has concluded with 10.3 billion U.S. dollars worth of projects signed. The expo held in the city of Changsha and was themed Common Development for a Shared Future aimed at boosting business links between the two sides while welcoming more made-in-Africa products into the Chinese market. The four-day event attracted over 100,000 visitors, including 1,700 foreign visitors and 9,000 on-site buyers and professional visitors, a record high in the Expo's five-year history. Eleven African countries also announced 74 corporate projects, the largest number in the Expo's history. And finally, hundreds of migrants and their supporters in the agricultural Miami suburb of Florida have taken to the streets in protest of a recently enacted law that targets undocumented immigrants after it went into effect on Saturday. Titled Senate Bill 1718, the law was signed by Governor Ron DeSantis in early May following its passage through the Florida House in a vote of 83 to 36. The law imposes penalties on Florida employers that fail to use E-Verify, a federal database system, to check the legal status of the employees. It also makes it a felony for anyone to knowingly transport an undocumented worker into the state. Hospitals that accept medic aid, a form of government health insurance, are also mandated to share financial data on the cost of treating undocumented patients under the law. Welcome back to the program. The president of Guinea-Bissau, Umaro Mbalo, paid what can be referred to as a private visit to Nigeria's new president, Bola Tinubu, at his residence in Lagos. President Umaro is also the chairman, authority, ECOWAS heads of state and government. He told the Nigerian president that ECOWAS supports his efforts to reposition Nigeria as a giant of Africa. He even commended economic policies announced by the new administration as good for West Africa. Speaking on the visits, a while later, the special advisor, special duties, communications and strategy to the president, Mr. Adelia Lake, said the meeting between the two African presidents was an appreciation of steps taken by President Tinubu last month. He said the Guinea-Bissau president was willing to cooperate with Nigeria and with President Tinubu in the near future. Now, the EU says Nigeria's general elections exposed enduring weakness and signaled the need for further legal and operational reforms to enhance transparency, inclusiveness and accountability. In its final report on the February elections, the EU listed the ambiguities in the law establishment of a publicly accountable process for selection of 
residence electoral commissioners and national commissioners ensuring real-time publication of and access to election results. The protection for media practitioners, the discrimination against women in elective and appointed positions, as well as impunity regarding electoral offences as challenges to the elections. The election exposed enduring systemic weaknesses and therefore signal a need for further legal and operational reforms to enhance transparency, inclusiveness and accountability. The electoral umpire represented by its national commissioner and chairman of the Information and Voter Education Committee, Fessus Okoye, says changes will need to be made legally. As far as the commission is concerned, there were so many positives to this election. There were also significant challenges and problems with the election. We are going to address those, those uh, uh, challenges and those, and those problems. And if, there are, if we receive most of the reports from the domestic and international observers, we, are, we will harmonize them, take out the actionable ones that have administrative flavor. And now to our focus for this week. The aborted mutiny that happened in Russia nearly two weeks ago. Russia says the way it handled the event shows its resilience and strength, and Western powers should keep away from its issues. But it does not show up off the impacts of the impunity, especially in this part of the world. The Wagner Group mercenaries who seized the Russian city of Rostov and Don on Saturday, June the 24th in a failed mutiny include at least three convicted criminals. Almost all the fighters who took part in a grievous threat to Russian President Vladimir Putin's rule to date had their faces covered so they could not be identified. Some news media say some of them had previously been in jail, underlining how the Kremlin's decision to allow Prigozhin to recruit thousands of mercenaries from prisons across the country last year came back to haunt it. Wagner fighters took control of the southern port and logistical hub for Russia's war in Ukraine on Saturday morning. The mercenary forces leader Yevgeny Prigozhin ordered his men to march on Moscow before they turned back in a failed bid to oust the longtime rival, Defense Minister Sergei Shogu. Russian media reported in September last year that the leader Yevgeny Prigozhin had visited prisons in Rostov, recruiting more than 1,000 convicts for Wagner. Wagner pulled out of Rostov and Don on Saturday evening after a deal was brokered by Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko. The Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko confirmed on Tuesday last week that Wagner chief Yevgeny Prigozhin had arrived in Belarus. On the same day, Russia claimed that the Wagner private military group will hand over its weapons and equipment to the Russian military. Lukashenko said Belarus will not build camps for the mercenary group, but it will accommodate them if they so require. Under the deal brokered by Lukashenko, Prigozhin abandoned what he called a match for justice by thousands of his men in Moscow in exchange for safe passage to Belarus. The Wagner chief said his actions were in protest of what he called attempts to disband the private military group and insisted he never intended to overthrow the government. The Russian Federal Security Services dropped its criminal case against the Wagner mercenary group, with President Vladimir Putin announcing that the Wagner fighters may either join the Russian military or head to Belarus. Some have wondered what this could mean for Wagner group mercenaries in Africa. In his address to the press on Friday, Russia's foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, said countries who have signed contract with the military mercenary group have to determine their future involvement. Wagner has over the past decade cemented strong ties with several African governments. According to leaked U.S. document, it has operations in at least eight African countries, including Mali, Libya, and the Central African Republic. Lavrov says apart from Wagner, Russia's defense ministry has several hundred military instructors working in the Central African Republic, and they want the West to stop trying to pressure African and Latin American countries over cutting ties with Russia due to the war in Ukraine. The Central African Republic has battled several rebel insurgencies since 2018. Over in Mali, the United Nations and Western powers say Wagner has committed possible war crimes alongside Malian forces battling jihadist militants. Mali and Russia have denied the allegations. Mali's military leaders say they are not hosting Wagner mercenaries, but trainers helping local troops with equipment bought from Russia. Leader of the Wagner group, Yevgeny Prigozhin, has been known for decades as President Vladimir Putin's chef due to his company's Kremlin's catering contracts. 
It is unclear how friendly he and Putin are, but they know each other. Both men were born and raised in St. Petersburg. Prigozhin began selling hot dogs in his hometown following a long prison sentence in the 1980s. He soon began to build up a state in a chain of supermarkets and eventually opened his own restaurant and catering company. The restaurant gained popularity and was soon hosting dignitaries including the then deputy mayor Vladimir Putin. From there, Prigozhin's catering firm Concord began to win government supply contracts, taking its operations to a much bigger level. Joining me now to discuss is political analyst Professor Femi Otubanjo. Professor, thank you for joining me on Diplomatic Channel. It's a pleasure to have you. Let's begin have by... Thank you very much. Yes, and always a pleasure having you on the program. What do you think really happened in Russia between the Wagner Group leader, uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin and President Vladimir Putin that resulted in the so-called aborted uh, mutiny? I don't think it was between Putin and Prigozhin. It was not really. It, I, I have a feeling that uh, Prigozhin was trying to draw attention uh, to some of his frustrations uh, and uh, to embarrass some top officers of the defense ministry with whom he had had a running battle. Uh, it's frustrated that he's not getting enough recognition uh, from the defense, from the regular army for the, his contributions in Ukraine. He's frustrated that they are not giving him enough supply. He has said that, that he was going to uh, exit Bakhmut if he didn't, didn't improve the quantity and quality of the supplies he was getting. Uh, of course, there's also the problem that maybe is beginning to be unable to sustain the level of casualties that his uh, group has faced. Zelensky uh, uh, or the, Prime, the president of uh, Ukraine recently, as just two days ago, said that uh, the Wagner group had lost 21,000 soldiers and had, as incurred, 80,000 casualties. Uh, injured soldiers in the fight in Ukraine. So that is not easy to bear, particularly if you think that you are not being, uh, you are not being well supported. Uh, the other, of course, the other perspective is that it might just simply have become a Frankenstein monster. Uh, you know that popular theme about some, a, a, a creation turning against its creator. Uh, uh, this Prigozhin man is rich, he's, is making money from all over the world, and they feel condescending to those soldiers, to those officers, and I think that they have the right to do what they are doing. Uh, so I, I think it's a matter of some. Uh, the other aspect, of course, is the, what uh, Machiavelli has always taught us that mercenaries are unreliable. Do not trust them. Uh, the, their level of disloyalty is very precocious. And uh, the more they have power, the more they're likely to turn against them. Uh, and, and I think that's what is happening there. But I don't think that against Putin, basically there are other, they might be wanting to precipitate the sack of these uh, top officers. Uh, and send Russian politics, uh, politics of loyalty to Putin. So everybody is struggling to be loyal. Everybody is stabbing everybody in the back. And I think this was an, a dramatic incident instance of that uh, uh, competition for the uh, nod of the president of Putin. Yeah, and I think it's important that you highlighted that uh, because uh, yeah. Prigozhin had known Putin since the 1980s, I think, uh, when he started his catering business, and then he and Putin became friends, which is how he got close enough to power. Is it fascinating, yeah. though, that uh, this group has been in existence, however, since 2014, uh, according to yeah. Prigozhin's own admittance, operating as a private entity, executing Russia's military bidding, especially in Africa? Yeah. Well, it's been around. Uh, it was there. I mean, 2014, 2015, basically in Syria. Uh, uh, it took over from the Slavic Legion, which fled miserably. They were recruited to protect the oil fields. And uh, the military good kings, the retired soldiers, the neo Nazis, who ultimately have to form the Wagner Group, 
said his own truth. I mean, they, they lost so heavily that he had to run away from the place. And then the Wagner war took over. And they, they did very well in uh, Syria. They recovered many oil fields for <laughs> at the cost of 25% of the production, uh, which was for their own commission. And at one point, they, they, I was told they were granted license to our troops, 230 or 240 kilometers, square kilometers of Syrian, uh, uh, Syrian territory to, to prospect for oil. So they have been around. They have been around. They, from there, they have moved to Libya, they have moved to Mali, they have moved to Central African Republic, and they are there and stand in Sudan where they are uh, working closely with the Rapid uh, Response Force. And so on. So it's been, they have been very active in uh, third world countries, particularly. Uh, and I think that we shall see the danger as the discussion progresses. Sort of su success, you know, can be attributed to the group's work here in Africa. They've been reported in Mali, in Central African Republic. Um, w what sort of success did they experience here in Africa leading up to their involvement uh, more recently in the war in Ukraine? Yes, well, to be honest, if you want to use the word success, you might say they have they succeeded in the Central African Republic. Uh, they have the government to suppress the, rebe the re rebellion, the civil war. Uh, they, the Wagner group fought on the side of the government and ultimately uh, was able to overpower uh, the rebels. In uh, uh, Mali, uh, they have no results to show yet. The, Mal the Mali people are saying they are not there to fight, they are just instructors, but they are paying them about $10 million every month. And um, what we know them for is the massacre of hundreds of people in central Mali. Uh, we have not, they have nothing to show for it. In Libya, they went and supported the, uh, the, the, the Eastern warlord who was trying to take over Tripoli. They also failed there. So their record of success in Africa uh, in Libya, they failed. In uh, Central Africa, they succeeded. In Mali, they are still there. But we are hearing that they might be expanding their activities to Burkina Faso, to Guinea, to Ivory Coast. And uh, uh, that, that portends a lot of danger. What encouraged them, you know, to get involved in the war in Ukraine? Because they have been fighting on the side of Russia. Um, the, the mercenaries had been, you know, uh, sort of doing the heavy lifting for the Russian uh, military uh, since the war started in Ukraine. Yeah, this, you know, this, this is a Russian, it's a state creation. The Ragnar group is, in spite of all pretenses, an instrument of the Russian government. It's the, the Putin himself said it only two, a few weeks, a few days ago, that the Wagner group got 953 million in, uh, in funds and supplies in the last one year. So they know why they have it. Is the Wagner Group is a covert instrument of Russian imperialism. You know, Russia is not very strong uh, in the international system. It does, it does not have that kind of connection that the Western powers have. It does not have the trade acumen of the Chinese, that the Chinese is using trade to penetrate Africa. And so it has resulted to this area of diplomacy of creating a shadowing army which is terrorizing uh, countries, vulnerable countries, which has the capacity to be a major uh, uh, danger to African countries, particularly those that have not got their acts right. So it is before, because Russia was losing so badly in, at the initial stage in Ukraine that the Wagner group was brought in to fight those dirty wars. The, the Wagner group takes more risk. It's uh, ruthless in terms of dealing. It, take, it almost takes no prisoners. It's, uh, uh, it it, it protects the Russian government from this accusation of war crimes because it can always say that they do not belong to the Russian army. So, and the recruitment of uh, uh, practices of Wagner is also not what you have in the regular army. You go to prisons and recruit prisoners yeah. and recruit criminals and give them huge incentives to fight. No state government can be associated with them, but the Russians are used, the Russian government is using this group to do these unethical things 
and stayed at home and claiming that they know nothing about it. Uh, the level of casualties also is a problem. The casualties that they are taking is idiots. No, no state government, no state can take that and justify it to its people that the way people are being killed. But these people are, who are being killed are people who have gone there to make money. So if they lose their lives, they lose their business. But if you take normal soldiers to the war ground and lose them in such numbers, you have something to answer for. Yeah, and I know that there have been videos of the uh, Wagner Group leader uh, showing him visiting the families of these soldiers and commiserating with them uh, on, on the loss of uh, the young men. I'm just wondering if African leaders can continue, African le leaders where the Wagner Group uh, mercenaries exist, talking about Mali, the Central African Republic, and Libya, if they can continue to, um, you know, trust the, the, the group itself, the, the soldiers, after witnessing what happened in Russia, the, the so-called mutiny that happened in Russia, and they were, they were about to march into Moscow and take over power, as you rightly mentioned earlier, from Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu. Yes, obviously, the Moscow and the incident the attempt to march on Moscow is a loud warning to all of those who want to uh, ride on the back of a tiger. Uh, no mercenary, if a mercenary group will almost remain a mercenary. And once you don't satisfy what they want, they turn against you. Yeah. That is reality. Unfortunately, this Wagner group is becoming a different, more sophisticated mercenary army. And it has been supported by the state, provided with all kinds of logistic support. In, in, uh, in uh, Libya, Russian aircraft were being used by this group. They have a base somewhere in, in Syria where they operate all over Africa. These are not the people you play around with. You are in power. If you depend on them, they are going to be in power at, at their best. They are going at the, when you feel that they have had enough of you, you have not given them what they want, they have not exploited your gold and mineral resources enough, then you might be thrown out. I understand that in Central Africa, the largest industrial gold mine there is controlled by a Wagner group. And the government has no say in it. They, they, they fly in their planes, they take whatever they want. The government, the government does not know what they're doing. And this is a danger to us in Africa, particularly all these most vulnerable countries. The Wagner group, it's, we are being warned that to prepare for them. They are coming. They are, they are in Mali. They are trying to expand to Burkina Faso to give in the name of helping us to fight the Islamic jihadists. You know, unfortunately, we are caught between the devil and the deep blue sea in the Sahara, between France, that is exploitative, and uh, the Wagner group now, being sponsored by Russia in the new, <laughs> in the new, uh, uh, statics of uh, imperialism or neocolonialism. A very interesting perspective. The group itself is now mm -hmm. said to be in, in Belarus currently, apparently cooling off uh, you know, its heels. But some analysts think that this was all a plot that uh, you know, the, Russian, the Belarusian president, Alexander Lukashenko, had once requested Russia open a front you know, in Belarus to fight the war in Ukraine. I remember that meeting happened a few months ago. Do you think that this mutiny was all an excuse, you know, to make this happen? I mean, here he is providing refuge for the um, uh, Wagner Group uh, mercenaries. Uh, they're currently said to be there already. Um, the leader himself, Yevgeny Prigozhin, does not have any problems with uh, President Putin, who has also said, you know, the soldiers themselves were not you know, will not face prosecution. He praised the Russian yeah. soldiers. And it's clear that there will be no repercussions for what has happened. So do you think this was all, you know, in the background, this is all just plain. Now, this was, this was a grand plot to probably eventually open that front that the Belarusian president had been asking uh, of the Russian president. It seems possible, but uh, it's just speculation. Uh, one has to be wary of... Uh, going into that area in which you have no facts to back what you are saying. Uh, it is quite, the government, diplomacy, governments are full of all kinds of, uh, uh, there's nothing beyond that. So I must not say it 
is, is not possible. That it is possible that uh, it was all a drama put up by Putin himself to get rid of some of his generals. It's possible, you know, because a coup attempt uh, is already a, uh, a rebellion like that is an opportunity for dictators to clean house. Uh, so we don't know what, what what has happened, but I know that there's more of Putin's investment in the Wagner group with the person that he would not deal with him. And you know, they are, you know, I just watched uh, a documentary in which the monies that are made from all over, from Syria, from Libya, oil fields, from uh, Central African gold fields, are channeled through all kinds of uh, fronts to the Kremlin. Sad, but almost true. Professor Femi Otobanjo, thank you again for speaking with me on Diplomatic yeah. Channel. Yeah. It's always a pleasure. Thank you. God bless. Have a good evening. You too. And that's Diplomatic Channel this week. More episodes can be viewed on the Channels TV playlist on youtube.com slash channelsweb. I'm Amarachi Ubani. I'll see you next time.